years, we've made a tremendous amount of progress in the field of the theoretical development in relationship to zero-point vacuum fluctuation dynamics. Zero-point vacuum fluctuation dynamics was first proposed by Heisenberg. It was first observed by Casimir. And in the last decade, there have been very serious attempts and some successful experiments, as you know, to confirm the effective force that pervades all matter. The 20th century has seen us make an idol out of mass. Einstein proposed equals mc squared, and we began to really consider the energy that is described in the dynamic that we call mass. In the latter part of this century, we are turning a new key. That key is the energy out of which that mass is precipitated. In 1962, John Archibald Wheeler of Princeton, in the review of modern physics, described the energy density of this field as 10 to the 93rd power grams per centimeter cubed. Zakharov in the Soviet Union, put off in the United States, Jenison in the UK, and several others have concurred with this conclusion, which is based on a limiting frequency or dimension of the fluctuation of the Planck wavelength, 10 to the minus 33rd centimeters. In point of reference, the mean density of our planet is 5.6 grams per centimeter cubed. The known mass of the universe is 10 to the 48th power, recently increased by two orders of magnitude, grams. This means that the energy that pervades every cubic centimeter of space, every single cubic centimeter of space, is actually greater than what is observed in the entire spectrum of mass energy. In a couple of decades, I think we'll look back at this time as a time when we began to wake up. We ceased to be hypnotized by an obsession with a secondary phenomenon. David Bohm in his book, Wholeness and the Implicate Order, has called mass noise that rides on the sea of infinity. This is not metaphysics. This mass, all mass, every particle is in this moment being the dynamic modification, only the dynamic modification of field space. It has no quality of stasis whatsoever. The solidity that has so obsessed our conceptual thinking is only a form of subjectivity. It has nothing to do with reality. Experiments at University of California, Berkeley, CERN, and many other particle physics labs have shown clearly excess momentum in particle experiments that has to be coming from somewhere. That's still in the Andrathal level. If we take this field 
which pervades us now, which our own bodies are modifications of. And we recognize that the reason we don't normally perceive it is because it is isotropic. It is uniform in its distribution with a little bit of noise. If we recognize this, then the concept of being able to precipitate particles out of this field will not seem so obtuse or distant. We introduce a stress into this field through the medium of the electromagnetic fields. We introduce a stress which says to the field, I have a lower density here and a higher density here, ever so slightly, but with a field that has 10 to the 93rd power grams, energy equivalents per centimeter cubed. Even a slight differential, a slight stress that is introduced into that field precipitates a particle. spend far less to precipitate particles. It is a synergistic phenomenon, but until we begin to break through this subjective and archaic presumption of the solidity of things, of the distance between objects, and begin to realize it is what is in the distance between objects that is important. It is the fluctuation field in that space that is important, that is primary, that is the seat, that is the source, that is the substance. And when we begin to realize that, then we begin to engineer technologies. The closed path home polar generator was the first technology we were specifically involved in. Many of you here already know about it. That generator has now been duplicated in proof of principle and proof of commercial feasibility form from the description in the art and the world patent. The government of India has spent the last three and a half years in a program headed by Pramahansa Tiwari to show whether or not Number one, it was scientifically feasible, not by my claims, but by their experiments based on my description, and then whether it was commercially viable. The Kaiga Atomic Power Plant in Karnataka, India, of which Brahmahatta Tiwari is the chief project engineer, is no longer the Kaiga Atomic Power Plant. As of January 1989, its name has been changed to the Kaiga Power Plant. Atomic has been dropped from it. Because as of January 1989, a panel appointed by Rajiv Gandhi has acknowledged the closed path homopolar generator to be commercially viable. This is in a country that has a very difficult time getting their hands on strategic materials. They don't even run this thing above 3,000 RPMs. In our Western nations, in Japan, in advanced technological societies who have access to materials, who have access to machines that get close to zero tolerance, it is not really such a big deal to be able to do much better it is somewhat surprising that the third world country 
after three and a half years of research, has been the one to continue to confirm the existence of this technology and its validity. We decided in January of 1989, after these events had transpired, to pursue a solid state version of the technology. Now, this does not mean that the solid state version of the technology is a solid state homopolar generator. Myth often said to be an in machine, which is a misnomer I would like to discard forever. Michael Faraday invented the unipolar generator, the one piece unipolar generator in 1831. Many of you already know this, but for those of you who don't, that's an important thing to understand. In the solid state reduction to practice, we are in an entirely new area of the reduction to technological practice. The solid state reduction turns out not to be so complicated. The first example we demonstrated, when I mention we, I mean my colleague and partner and friend, David Farnsworth, who happens to be the grandson of Philo Farnsworth, who happens to be the man who invented the television in the United States. In the solid state reduction we demonstrated at the UN on June the 7th, 1989, 29 and a half volts input, 4.65 amperes, 1600 volts output, 4.65 amperes, with no impedance losses. I didn't know I was coming here, for sure, until Wednesday. So, we will be very happy to receive into our laboratory bona fide interested parties. Boeing engineers have confirmed the functionality of our technology in the United States. But it is only a little step, a very little step, embarrassingly simple. We did not make a, ma a maze out of a straight road. Something complicated wasn't necessary. The same technology was demonstrated June the 12th at the United States Senate. You didn't hear about it. It's documented, it's in the congressional record, but no press was allowed. The demonstration was sponsored by U.S. Senator Timothy Worth of Colorado. All we have to do is in a resonant domain, introduce a heterodyning wave or a standing wave properly. And it increases the effective field density in a given electromagnet circuit. It increases the effective density of that field by orders of magnitude. We are only just beginning to scrape the surface. But long ago, we left behind the heresy that more energy can't come out of a process than goes into it because we realized that every atom and molecule already represented a perpetual motion machine, the great heresy. Every atom and molecule already continues and has temporal integrity until it is otherwise destroyed, which you never destroy it, right? You dissemble it. The energy is conserved. Well, we're not not conserving energy. We're just dipping our cup into the lake. It has nothing to do with not conserving energy. Of course, energy is conserved. 
It's just that we have ignored 93 orders of magnitude of our own existence. It is not metaphysics, it is not religion, it is not philosophy. It's simple. It's simple, but it's also hard to conceive of. I mean, how do you think about 10 to the 93rd power grams per cubic centimeter? Who can think about that? An arbitrary volume in the midst of space. Everything is abundantly given. The politics of scarcity that have so belabored our planet to the point where we now, in the last year alone, in Brazil alone, lost 8 million hectares of forest because people thought they needed the land and the energy from the wood and the fires were out of control. 8 million hectares burned. 1.6 trillion pounds of oxygen production was lost. It is the politics of scarcity and the failure to recognize the implicit abundance in the physics of existence itself that has forced the extreme stratification of economies. This is an abundant country. Many countries in this world are not so abundant. But India, within 10 years, will be energy independent. 880 million people who don't need fuel. Think about it. It's front page news in India. 880 million people who won't need anything to power their country. Now, are we going to say, oh yeah, that's good? It has to be done everywhere. Why? Because we can't afford, and we all know it now, we're in a much, much, much more conducive moment for change. We all know that we can't continue to build up greenhouse gases. Everybody knows that. See, it's common knowledge now. We've gotten over the people who were asleep at the wheel in their jobs and too many institutions across this planet who said, no, that will never happen. We all know now, which we didn't just a few years ago, that the, strat that the stratospheric ozone layer is globally depleted. Even Maggie Thatcher acknowledges We know we can't live with this any longer. So why not make an investment in life? If we make an investment in life, the investment will grow disproportionately to our bank accounts. If we make an investment in a technology that allows us to be free from fuel, then we can take the energy and resources that went into fuel and heal the planet that has been damaged by its use. But we can't do that unless we have the will as a race to go through our own glasnost. Not just new thinking. We need a global perestroika because I can tell you the people in my country are starting to feel the downside of what happens when oil is pulled out from under you. All of a sudden, your money isn't worth anything anymore. All of a sudden, the dollar in 1967 is worth 23 cents today in 1967 dollars in the United States. Instead of leaning on a broken crutch, why not tap into the coherent being? The coherent being of existence is not a metaphysical concept. Even the high priests acknowledge it. 
not the Pope. Although he may, and he may call it Spiritus Sancti or something. But with 10 to the 93rd power grams, we scrape the surface very, very lightly. And suddenly we have, as we demonstrated in New York, 54 times output in voltage. You can't go on forever in voltage. It's just a simple experiment. You can't go on forever with the beginning. We've been in this beginning. Dr. Nieper, who sits here, stuck his neck out in 1980 and had a conference with very, very, very respected people in the audience and said this is a possibility because he recognized it needed to happen. This is nine years later and the engine is just starting still. We don't have time for us to be able to stand here in nine years and still be just starting. Consider the world investment and waste. And consider that if we take one or two percent of that investment, we can heal the planet in this way. There is not time in this session to go through all of the implications. I understand that. I will be available today and tomorrow. And whatever questions I can answer, whatever questions you have, be they technical or otherwise, I'll be happy to make myself available. And thank you very much for your attention.